And that's a completely different life. That's a life that gives love to people, where you serve the client again, where you work for excellence, where you have fulfillment, where you feel yeah, significance, you contribute to someone and to someone's life, you see the smile of the client on his face again, and yeah, you get a different world. And that's a world where people flourish, where employees flourish, where the client flourish, and where life is more, yeah, more abundant. Uh, here at the Git Faith, we want to uh, be involved in a movement and to facilitate a movement for professionals, business people, entrepreneur managers that want to integrate their faith uh, with their uh, business, with their work. And uh, thank you so much for all your help and support, uh, for being an inspiration, for being a role model and for sharing with us. special guest. Uh, we are privileged to have Walter Droppers here with us and uh, we would like to talk about uh, the Jerusalem entrepreneur and about biblical principles for growth uh, in uh, in business. So uh, Walter, let's uh, know you a little bit. Uh, please tell us about you and uh, how did you arrive in the point to write this book? Oh, thank you Ruben for inviting me here. It's a privilege to be in Romania and uh, to serve you. Yeah, indeed, my name is Wouter Droppers. I'm coming from the Netherlands. I'm married. I have two children. Uh, I was for 35 years. I'm already in business, advising entrepreneurs and business leaders all over Europe. And I was in also uh, president of several companies myself for 24 years, uh, especially in the automotive sector. Uh, we shared uh, spare parts for automobiles. I was president of several dealerships for Volkswagen and Audi. And I work for one of the biggest resellers of cars in the Netherlands, responsible for Volvo and the Range Rover brand. And currently I'm uh, president of Europartners. And Europartners is a movement all over Europe for business leaders. And we are very intentional. Uh, we would like to help. Let me phrase it that way. We would like to help business leaders to be very intentional about their faith in their business. And also to share the gospel with others. Wow. It's a very nice uh, road and a very nice journey. But um, what does it have in common uh, business uh, with uh, writing a book? <laughs> How did you arrive to the point of writing this book? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I give many speeches. I talk a lot about faith and business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many people have many questions. And I was thinking, okay, now I'm always talking about it, but why not writing? Then people can read it themselves. And uh, you can multiply it uh, very easily and you can give it away. So I thought it was necessary to write a book about... Uh, faith and business and it also contains my personal story so I explain many personal stories many examples of what I've seen in business in my business life and that makes it very well read mm -hmm. and um, please uh, tell us um, uh, what would a, a reader for example uh, an entrepreneur or a business leader uh, find in this uh, book what uh, what do you think it's uh, uh, the the difference maybe between a Jerusalem entrepreneur and uh, any other entrepreneur? Yeah, the book starts with uh, what I saw in business. Basically, you have uh, two kind of businesses. Uh, I know it's very uh, general, but uh, you have one type of entrepreneur. They work only for themselves, for their own. Uh, their motto is the end justify the means. Uh, I want to become rich. I want to become important. I would like, uh, yeah, To, to make my business grow. But basically, it's all about themselves, me, myself, and I. And you have entrepreneurs who see business as a way to serve society and to solve the needs of the client and uh, to be of service because they love people and would like to serve people. And uh, their uh, motto is more, how can I add value and be of a blessing for the client, for the suppliers, and all the stakeholders uh, in my company, including themselves, because a business needs to be profitable, otherwise it cannot exist. And uh, uh, what what do you think are the, the key, uh, maybe, characteristics of a, a Jerusalem entrepreneur? How, how would you define? Yeah, I use the metaphor of Jerusalem and Babylon, because uh, in the scripture you see uh, that... The story of Jerusalem and Babylon starts in Genesis and ends in Revelation. And it's, it's a, there are two cities who you can compare with each other. And let us start with the book of Revelation, where we see the city of Babylon. Uh, it's ruled by a spiritual power called the prostitute of Babylon. 
And this spiritual power, she's clothing in herself with precious stones, with precious clothes. Uh, she's really showing off. She's very rich. She's very wealthy. She's very prosperous. She likes to party. She likes to organize parties. And everyone looked to her and said, wow, what a beautiful lady. She is that. She has everything I admire. And therefore, she's called a prostitute because everyone fornicates with her. Everyone would like to copy her lifestyle, to copy her the way she lives and become as prosperous, as rich and as wealthy as she is. Uh, but she has a, a shadow side. And the shadow side is she uses people for their own advantage. Mm. And the other shadow side is she's prosecuting the Christians. And... Uh, yeah, when you compare this culture with this other city, the city of Jerusalem, there we see another spiritual power. It's also in Revelation. And that spiritual power is God. And he's not glorifying himself, but he's making himself humble. He moves from heaven to earth. And this prostitute is trying to glorify herself and move earth to heaven and become important. And But God is going back to earth and he's dwelling among the people to take the tears out of the eyes of the people, to care for the people, to love for the people. He's really serving the people. So he has a complete different attitude. He's not clothing himself with precious stones, but he's clothing the city with precious stones. And the city is beautiful because of these precious stones. We represent the promises of God for his people and for his nation. And he's even the clothing the foundations that's beyond the soil and under the ground, what you don't see. He's closing that with precious stones. And I think that symbolized that he works on character development and uh, human development and personal development and that our beauty shines from inward out. As the prostitute is closing herself from the outside and her beauty shines just outwardly. But uh, Jerusalem city is shining from inside out. And God is also closing his people with precious clothes. He's not closing himself with precious clothes. He said he's closing the people with the white clothes of righteousness. So, and that are the good deeds of the people. So the city becomes important and is, is showing off because it's a righteous city, it's a city of justice, and, uh, and people do good deeds. And I think that's what we do should do with our company. This company we have is not for to enrich ourselves, to show off, to become important, uh, to, to become very wealthy and prosperous. There's no, it's not wrong, but uh, it's not the goal. And, and the city of Jerusalem is inwardly, uh, because they do good deeds, they strive for righteousness, they strive for justice, they love other people, and therefore it's beautiful and people would like to live there. Now, if you look at these two cities, their uh, origin and their foundation is already in Genesis. In Genesis, we see the character of Nimrod. Nimrod, he was uh, described as the first one who used power to build his empire. And uh, by using power, he was submitting people. He, bu he built the first world empire of that time. He established the big cities of Nineveh, of Babylon, of Damascus. And this whole, what we call the current Middle East, was more or less his empire. And uh, he used power to submit people. And he was also named for that he was a great hunter. And you know, to his earning model, the, the model he made more money was not like it was used in that days, uh, to take care of the cattle, uh, to be in agriculture, to pluck the soil, to fertilize the soil, to make it grow. So that's what they did in those days. They lived in small tribes and families. And uh, the well-being of the family was when everyone in the family has a good life, they called it well-being. And Nimrod was challenging that paradise. said, no, well-being is not when everyone have a good life. When I have a good life <laughs> and I can rule over people, then world is perfect. He was not adding value to the cattle, to the soil, to become more prosperous. No, he was hunting, he was killing, and he was taking. So he was looking to the other as a competitor. And he said, there is only one pie and I need to take my share of it. So, And that was a completely new paradigm. Sure, in the old days they also had wars, but there was more a war about a well, uh, a war about, hey, you coming on my area, or you kill my daughter, and I, but not to submit people and to build a world empire. That was completely new in that days. Now, the, 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 the comparison king of the first, uh, because Nimrod was the first king of Babylon, and the first king of Jerusalem is described as Melchizedek. 
And Melchizedek was a completely different character as Nimrod because he was called the king of righteousness and the king of justice. And he was blessing Abraham. So he was there to, to bless, to bring justice, to help, to serve. And that was the initial king of Jerusalem. And, uh, and Nimrod was not there to serve and, uh, and to bless. No, he was there to conquer and, and to take. Now, in these two paradigms, you see also in business. You see when you enter into a boardroom, uh, some people talk about the status symbols, about the earnings they make, about how they are always smart to, to put the competition out. And in the other boardroom, when you meet and you talk with the management team, they are talking about how can we add value? Add value to the client, add value to our suppliers. And sure, they make a profit because they have to exist, but there's a completely different mindset and, and culture within that boardroom. Now, and I describe these two cultures, how they collide with each other and uh, what the characteristics are. And uh, how do you think it's possible to make the transition from uh, Babylon paradigm to Jerusalem uh, paradigm? Uh, is it possible? Uh, how, how do you think? Uh, what would be some steps for, for example, a young entrepreneur that is in business uh, and uh, he gets into this business world that he likes and it's very interesting, he likes the game. Uh, you also get some benefits maybe out, out of it. How do you think it's possible to make the transition? Uh, yeah, that's not easy. And uh, many people get lost uh, and uh, somewhere along the line they start to worship this uh, culture of glory and celebrity realization, uh, uh, having the appreciation of the people, being glorified, that slowly comes in. Maybe you are not intentional in that, but it just happened many times. It happened in my life as mm. well. And uh, and to get out of that, it needs to have a heart change. You need to have a change of heart and a change of thinking, but that's not easy. It will not happen by just maybe reading the book or how having this information because most business people start with a good heart. When I started in my business, I was there to serve the customer. I think the first 10 years of my life was really serving the customer, adding value, and that made me successful. And that made me that people uh, like me, that they like the business, the way I did business, and I will start growing. And then slowly over time, you see that what is happening, that not serving the customer becomes the goal, but profit and wins a profit uh, maximization becomes the goal. And then the whole model starts to change because when the customer is the goal, you start to bring a good service to serve the customer and you get some money in reward uh, as a reward for it. And you call that a blessing more or less. And sure, you need it for your pension, for bad days, when turnover is there, when a crisis comes, to maintain your family, now you know all the things. But when you start to focus on profit maximization, then the client is more or less only a tool or an ATM machine to provide for that. Mm. And the service is not important anymore. So the product you deliver or the service you give is not important anymore. They are only seen as costs. So you, because you need to produce something because otherwise the client will not buy it. But what he buys and if it is really beneficial for him, you don't care about. It's only that the machine goes running. And... Uh, So you could have that, for example, when you start to sell mortgages, that you still also sell insurances next to the mortgage, but that you start to sell insurance people don't need. But because they are unaware, they don't know how the market is, they uh, feel insecure, maybe they are fearful, they are easy prey uh, to sell an insurance because an insurance you sell security, you sell safety. And in that way, you maybe you have a much higher profit, but people don't know, don't need it. Uh, it could also happen that when you work in infrastructure, for example, in building, uh, I, my my uh, my father he was in building, and when he built a house, he talked with the client about the house. How do you want to build a house? What are the requirements? They made a design. They talked about it. Said maybe you change this or you change that or you could be the, do this. And then they made an agreement about the price and he built a house. And when the house was finished, he was proud on it. And he came to the owner and said, this is your new house. He handed over the key and he was satisfied. The owner was satisfied and sure he received his money. But nowadays what you see many times is, okay, there's a house project. Requirements comes in. And first the requirements go to the juridical department. And the juridical department is checking everything. Is there something in the contract that is maybe wrong 
or we can make money of it, or we can use it. And when they find then the requirements go to the architect, and he's also looking, is the construction right, or did they make mistakes? And when they find some mistakes, they underwrite with a lower price to the project, they receive the project, and then they go back to the owner and say, yeah, you received the project, but there are many mistakes here. And you should change this and change that. And, and then they make money of the failures. And then uh, they raise the price, they make more money. And because they don't care about the buyer, it could be that they give a inferior quality that they say, oh, the concrete can be ah, one uh, centimeter less. Uh, a little less steel in the concrete. Uh, maybe we should change the materials of the floor. And, uh, and they start to make savings on the product. And then they put maybe the suppliers under pressure. Oh, you should deliver for less because, yeah, terrible deal, cannot do it. And, and so they make savings on the supplier. So they increase their profit. But at the end, they have an inferior quality of the house. They made money uh, on the cost and expenses of the buyer. And where satisfaction and the fulfillment is only there when their bank account is rising. Hmm. So they probably will not be there to hand over the key because they are not proud on the project. They don't care about the customer. And only when the money comes in, they are proud. Now, that's a completely different paradigm. And uh, I would I see that paradigm as death. I call it that. It's death in economy. It's death in society. It brings society down. It brings people down. You have an inferior quality of life, an inferior quality of business, and I actually I hate it. Uh, how to get away about this picture? Because this picture gives money, and many people admire the role models. They see the, the expensive cars people drive. They see the houses people have. They see how oh, they're all meeting up with the people who are important in society. I would like to belong to that. And then uh, maybe you move in that, that direction. And I told you, I was moving into that direction as well. Uh, I was in car business, I was doing very well, making a lot of money, and I was losing myself more or less. And, uh, and one day I came home and my wife said, I don't know, if you maintain this behavior, probably we will get divorced. And I was thinking, what's going wrong? Because I was raised as a Christian, I was a Christian at that, that time, had a nice family, had a nice home, we had a nice car, we can go on vacations, we can sustain ourselves. I, every Sunday we go to church, we had a social business, we give money away. So I did everything well according to the pastor and to my parents. And now my wife started complaining. So what went wrong? And... Uh, when we talked about it and discussed it, she said, it's not that you do wrong things, but you don't care about people anymore. You don't see me standing. You don't ask how I feel or what I uh, experience. And when she explained that to me, I started to realize that all my relationships were changed, that clients were profit or ATM machines, that... Uh, staff and employee became cost or production means, that friends were a good time, and that basically my wife at that time only was there for me to serve me, to give me a nice upbringing, good upbringing for the children, uh, good care for me, uh, showing off at network parties, good help in the house, and give me a home. But I was not really interested in her desires, in her longings, in her life. I never asked about it. And, uh, and when I realized that, I said, whoa, where did I come? Because that was never my intention. And I saw that also in, within the company, we started to, to, I was very successful in my company. I can, success was maybe in my trademark, they told me. So uh, people would like to partner up with you, and you start to live in a different level, in a different environment. And what I saw, we were not taking care of the local market anymore. We were only doing the big deals with the important guys and, and making money of that. And slowly also the company went down in its performance and in its excellence because we did not focus on the excellence and serving the client anymore. We only focus on the money and making the big deals. And there you see also that coming then into the company. And you surround yourself with people who think the same, who act the same. And your management team is acting according to what you do. And you see that the whole culture is shifting in the company because you are shifting and, and you move into another direction. 
And when I realized that, I said to myself, oh, I would like to build another culture. We need to have another culture. This is really decay in, in culture and in the company, and we're going down. And and then I started to recognize it in other companies as well, and I started to recognize with other people as well. And uh, I would like to shift. And then uh, at that time, I decided to step out of this company and look for a company with a healthy business culture. And that I found when I started working with uh, Volks- of, uh, Volvo and Range Rover. And, uh, and that's a completely different life. That's a life that gives love to people where you serve the client again, where you work for excellence, where you have fulfillment, where you feel yeah, significance. You contribute to someone and to someone's life. You see the smile of the client on his face again. And yeah, you get a different world. And that's a world where people flourish, where employees flourish, where the client flourish, and where life is more, yeah, more abundant. Uh, and I think that that is that's better. And that's why I wrote the book. Wow! Thank you so much, Walter. It's uh, it's very interesting. Maybe uh, you can tell us a little bit also some uh, uh, biblical principles. Uh, for example, uh, for for business, uh, from your experience, what. Do you think that it's important for a Christian uh, uh, entrepreneur and uh, manager to know and apply from the Bible? Are the, those things uh, really applicable in business or it is nice principles but do, don't work in, in real life? Uh, how do you think that these uh, biblical principles could really uh, affect our, our business? And uh, what are some recommendations from your side? Yeah, I think you have to distinguish two things. The one thing is the principles you can work by, but the principles, uh, as they are also in the Bible, uh, many people embrace. Also good humanists, good Muslim people, good Jewish people, they embrace the same principles, the same values. So there we don't distinguish so much. So let us first go to the question, what is then Christian entrepreneurship? And, And maybe then go to the principles, because when you... Don't answer the question right about what is Christian entrepreneurship. You will not answer the questions right about the principles. What I saw, I told you I moved to uh, Range Rover and Volvo. And I worked there within a company uh, with high ethical values. I moved there because the business culture was right. But the owner was not a Christian. So we agreed on the values. We had the same values. And I think, I dare to say, he was more ethical than I was. And uh, I know we did once a... Uh, Uh, a merger and, and we took some dealerships uh, we bought some dealerships and I did the due diligence I did the interviews with the people and I presented him a plan to reorganize the company and, and to make new profit again and then I said oh we will uh, fire this guy and we will fire that guy and fire that guy and we'll bring in some people from our own company to run it well and uh, maybe one year loss and then we will uh, be profitable again And then he was asking as a non-Christian, but Walter, I think you are a Christian. Why are you firing all these people? <laughs> I said, yeah, you know, these people don't function well. They have a wrong mentality. They don't have the right attitude. And it will take a lot of time to train them and to develop them and better get rid of them. And now we have the time. We are in this takeover. And uh, he said, but that's something I don't like. And what I don't like from you, also you claim to be a Christian, but I, I don't see it that way. How does it come that these people don't perform well and they have a wrong mentality and that they uh, work in a a wrong way? I thought, yeah, you know, the former leader, he had the wrong measuring points, the wrong KPIs, he was judging the people falsely. And uh, he said, oh, it's the leader who creates the people and the mentality and the culture uh, and change everything. So yeah, that's true. Oh, now you are the new leader, you can change them. And uh, we keep them in our business and you train them and you develop them and you give them good KPIs. And and I learned a lot of that. And uh, so the values of this non-Christian were higher and he had a higher sensitivity for being just than, than I had as a Christian. So that left to me the question, where do we distinguish? And what does it make a Christian in business a Christian? or a Christian business, or a Christian person in business, it's not only the values. Maybe it's not about the values at all, because you can have the same. Now, what happened uh, after this company, I moved to CPMC in the Netherlands. And CPMC is like a guilt fate, you have in Cluj, uh, a movement for an association 
uh, from Christian business people who would like to make Christ known in the marketplace and be intentional about their faith in their business. And when we I started uh, to become president of that Dutch association, uh, the board said we would like to grow and become the most important uh, entrepreneurial association in the Netherlands. And we made a plan and I worked on it. And after one year, for the first time in my life, I was not successful in achieving my goals because we had some growth, but it was not really impressive. And uh, we didn't reach the targets and we didn't get the exposure we want. And I started to worry. I started to worry about my reputation, how to explain it to the members, how to explain it to the board. And now I work for God and I was not successful. So I went into a retreat and uh, I tried to listen to God. God would have you to say to me. And uh, basically my prayer was, God, now I work for you in your kingdom, but I lack success. And in the past I was also very successful. So what's going wrong? Do I do something in my life? It's a sin in my life. Is something else wrong? And then God was asking me the question, and uh, it's not an audio voice, but uh, more through my mind and through my uh, meditations. Uh, he was asking me the question, do you really work in my kingdom? I said, yeah, I work now in ministry. And he said, I doubt it. I said, you doubt it? Why do you doubt it? I said, why are you here? Is it because your reputation is at stake, or is it because my reputation is at stake? No, it was because my, uh, Wouter's reputation was at stake. And uh, he said, but when it would be my kingdom, my reputation will, is at stake. So probably it's your kingdom, because you have the feeling that you have failed, that you are not successful, and it's all about you. And that opened my eyes, but I tried to have a discussion, but we need to do our part of the job, and cannot be. And then I received Psalm 127, where it's standing, uh, unless the Lord is blessing the builders, they will bless in vain. Unless the Lord is blessing the people on the watchtower to guard the city, they will guard in vain. And man, early in the morning you go out in bed, late in the evening you go to sleep, and you toil yourself for a little piece of bread. And that was a bomb. Because that was my life. Early in the morning I go out, spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, late in the evening I go to bed, and the results were poor. And now God is saying, but I gave my beloved one in their sleep, so should I then do nothing? Uh, so that was a, a struggle for me, how to how to deal with that. And I went to the board, and, and the board said, okay, let us review what we do. So we took a flip over, we put all the activities there, we put a column with all the prices and all the costs and all the efforts and all the energy, and we put a column with what, what does it bring to God and the kingdom. Uh, and then we saw that the big events, they took a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money, high risk there, but they were not so transformative because people slammed each other on the shoulder, had a great time, drank something, do some network. But we also did Alpha Course. Alpha Course was very transformational. People came to Christ. We had the small groups. We had a spiritual leadership course. We had the, the Mana Mana a devotional. It was highly valued. And when we saw that, we skipped all the events that did not contribute to the result for the kingdom. And uh, we needed less people at the office. We went from five to two persons in staff. And this all happened in 2007, 2008. And in 2008, the financial crisis came, Lehman Brothers uh, fell. 2009, the donations were still good in place, but in 2010, the donations dropped. But we had no problem because we had less people. And we did less. But something amazing happened. In 2010, more people came to Christ in our ministry than ever before. More people were transformed than ever before. And then I remembered this person. Uh, I can give it my beloved one in the sleep. We did less and God did more. I said, here is the secret. Here is the secret of Christian entrepreneurship. When we involve God in our strategy, in our talks, in our planning, when we give him the honor, when we renounce from what we all have to do to build our own brand or our own name or, or whatever, uh, and God sees our heart, he will do his part, and then we can be much more successful. Uh, and then we are before. So many people think there is a relationship, uh, a clear relationship between input, what you put in your company, how much time, how much effort, how much money, etc., and the output. And I doubt that. There is sometimes a relationship, but it's not completely makeable or constructible. Uh, God can do much more than we can imagine. And we should always live from that 
curiosity and this uh, amazement of what God is doing. Sure, we play our part. The builders need to build. And the watch people need to be at the watchtower to watch. But unless God is blessing it, it will not give the result as we uh, can achieve. So if you talk about growth models, successful business, it starts by prayer, by listening to God, by understanding his voice, and uh, having him in your business as the owner. Because many times we see it as our business. You know, my prayer was uh, many times, God, please bless me or bless me today or make me successful today. And now my prayer has changed and said, God, what do you want to do today with your money? What do you want to do today with your business? Where do you want me to go uh, as your ambassador uh, in business? And that's a completely different prayer. Uh, if we start to ask, oh, please bless me and make me profitable, then it's very much about me. But when we renounce from ownership and we hand over the, our money, our finances, our company, our personal life, our skills to God and ask them, what do you want to do with your company, with your money, with your talent, with the people you entrusted to me? Uh, that's a completely different paradigm. And we see that in the Bible. You know, when God was asking Selman, what do you want to be? Or what do you want to have? He was not asking for money. He was not asking for richness. He said, Give me the wisdom to guide your people well. He understand that it was not his people, it was not his nation, it was not his kingdom, but to guide your people well. Give me the wisdom to treat them well, to help them well, to serve them well. And I think that's what we should do. Renounce from ownership, hand over to God, and ask God the wisdom to, take, uh, to be good stewards of his property, of his business, of his finances. I think Christian business starts there. And not in the values. And sure, Selman was a wise person. He gave good advices and he had high values. We can apply as well. And everything God describes works. So even the non-Christians look what God describes. And because it works, they also apply it. So uh, you see that our whole society, even in, in Western Europe, is built on Christian values. Uh, why is that? Because the values work, because God invented them, and the values work, and people apply them. But that can non-Christians do as well. And they are smart people, and they see the values work, and therefore they apply them and do it as well, and become also prosperous. So that is not unique for Christian. Unique for Christian is this personal relationship to God, and this handing over of your life to Christ, because you love God, you love Christ, and you would like to serve the world. And too much, the, the world uses these values to become rich themselves or to, to get the benefits to themselves. And the great thing of God is that when you start to serve people, there's also a return to yourself. But when that becomes your motivation, you are still in the wrong city. Walter, how would you redefine success in these terms? Uh, what would success look like for a Christian uh, business uh, person or a Christian entrepreneur? Yeah, I was very successful. I told you success was my trademark. Therefore, I was the love darling in, uh, in the spare parts company and afterwards uh, with Volkswagen and Audi. And, uh, but it was on the expenses of relationships. Uh, like this prostitute in Babylon uh, is prosperous on the expansion of others. And uh, what you see, uh, what many times we think of economy of the division of limited means. Uh, and... I think success is that you create abundancy for everyone who is involved. Many times we see business as uh, some kind of war with competitors, and we need to take our part out of the pie. But I think if we can build businesses who bless all the stakeholders, the client, the suppliers, society, everyone who is involved, that uh, you create abundancy. And I think the challenge is not to take your share of the pie, but to create abundancy. Abundancy of life, I call it. And abundancy of life has not to do only with money. It's all more to do with relationships. Are you able to love people? And are you uh, willing to, to be loved? And, and to receive love from others? And for me, in my business success, that was difficult. I told you the story. I, I, I use people. I manipulate people for own benefit. But I even did not love myself. I was insecure about myself. Therefore, I needed the successes. Therefore, I want to partner up with other people. 
and that other people love me, now I would like to give to other people, you know, to play the, 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 the upper part and, and to give money away. But when people start to give me money, I said, no, 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 not necessary. I was, I could hardly receive. And what you, when you cannot love properly, and you cannot receive properly, and you live only for yourself, you know, then you become lonely, and you become existential lonely. This loneliness becomes so big that you try to compensate it with attention by doing things instead of by being loved and able to love. And I think if you talk about success in life, that is being able to love people and being able to receive love from other people. But before you can do, you need to know people. You need to be in connection with people because I cannot love someone who I don't know. So you have to build relationships where you can get to know other people and where other people can get to know you because otherwise they cannot open up. And I think being able to love and receive love, being able to know and being known by others, I think that is the core of life. And the whole Bible talks about it. When Jesus has talked about eternal life in John 17 verse 3, he said, the eternal life is that you know God and Jesus who they really are that you know them so deeply that you really love them for who they are, that you know their character, that you know who they are, as you can love your own wife. You know, I know my wife. When I see her, when I see her face, I already know what she thinks. When I see her behavior, I already... And I feel that we are deeply connected. And that is, that, that's a gift, and I really celebrate. But imagine that you can do that with everyone. And Paul is saying, now we look in a mirror, we look vaguely, but in the future, we will known as we are known. And imagine that there is someone who know you completely. I talk with people about this topic, and they said that's scary, because I share my life with this friend. I tell my professional life, and with this friend, I share my emotional life, and with this friend, I share my fun. And I have different friends, and I share different parts of my life. And I asked him, "Why don't you share your whole life with one?" He said. I don't know if they will love me afterwards because I also have my shadow sides. I'm not a well of loveliness and well-being and all. And if they would know me completely, will they love me completely? And imagine that there is someone who knows you completely and loves you completely. I think there is there we come to the secret of life that we can be open without shame, without guilt, being fully known and fully loved, and that we can love others and know others. And imagine that you as an entrepreneur can do that in business. That you know your client, that you know where he is, that you can love him, that you can take care for him. And that he, as a response, start to know you, who you are with your company, where you are with your values, where you are with your image. And, and they said, I, I love that so much. I would like to be part. And that you build these kind of relationships. And sure, it is a business relationship. It is a transaction that is... That's where business is about. But if that is filled with a heart full of love that is able to know and is able to make himself know to others and to build this relationship with staff, with employees and with suppliers, how would that change your environment? How would that change your business? How would that change your service you give to someone? And I think there is the core of life. That is the abundancy of life. That is, if you can have such a life in your personal life, in your life with God, that you don't have to perform for God anymore, and don't have to pretend anymore, that you have this fully open relationship, and that you can have that with your wife and, and with your children, and and that you also can have it in your family. And then people say, yeah, but people will take advantage of you. When you become that vulnerable, people do, will uh, use you. Why? You are, you know where you give and where you not give. Uh, you are still in control. Uh, they cannot take your inner freedom to make the choice how you will respond in a certain situation. To be really free is also to be really free to respond freely to any situation as you would like. Jesus was not always responding nicely. He can also draw lines and say, this is a boundary, this is a limit, you don't cross this line, because I have self-worth. I am someone. I am not to manipulate. We cannot manipulate God. We cannot say we believe in you if you do this or if you pretend this. And God is has self-worth. He has self-value. He loves himself too much to be just an instrument to be used or manipulated by other people. And if you can be really free and then you have this self-love 
and you can love others. I think then you you come close to how man should be. And I think that's the, the big commitment from love God with all your strength, with all your heart, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So self-love is a part of it. And what we see is this self-love by many entrepreneurs is uh, is twisted, is polluted, because they love themselves, but they don't love others. They become egoistic, they become narcissists. It's all about themselves. So that's a, a poisoned type of self-love, but that you have self-value and therefore can draw lines and set limits that people cannot abuse you or use you because you are still in control. And you would think too valuable about yourself just to expose you to others and uh, and being manipulated. I think there is the that's really success if you can have that kind of life and that kind of mindset. Okay, for uh, uh, achieving this success, you need to love others and to be loved, uh, but also uh, you need to do something that you're passionate about. How sure. how can somebody? find their uh, calling, uh, um, especially if you're a Christian, we believe also that uh, we have a calling uh, from God, we have some gifts. How can somebody, uh, maybe it's at the beginning of the career, uh, identify or make some steps in their calling? Yeah, I think a, a calling is always strongly connected to who you are. God wired you in a in a certain way. Uh, you have alpha people, you have beta people, you have people who are, have a high intellect, you have people who are low intellect, you have a craftsman, you have skilled people. Everyone has its own role in society to play. And that's strongly connected by how you are wired, who you are. And I think there are four areas you need to consider to find your calling. And the first area is the values you would like to, love, to live your life by. And what are your guiding principles? What are your life values? I told you already, I would like to love people. I would like to serve people. I would like to know people. I would like to love uh, and to live from relationships. So that's a high value for me. So don't put me in a, uh, as a computer scientist somewhere in a room just to work on algorithms because I will die there. And so my motivational circumstances, that's the, the second area, is that I uh, someone who likes to work in relationships. So I need people around me. I need an environment also where I can lead because that's who I am. Uh, I would like to, to run forward. So uh, give me a job without too much requirements and tell me how not how to do the job, but this is the goal. Achieve it. Do it your way. Then I flourish. So that are the motivations. So the values are important. The motivational cir circumstances are important. What motivates a person to do the job? His personality, I think, is important, and his skills. And somewhere in the middle is your calling. So if you know your skills, if you know what kind of person you are, if you know what, what gives you energy, and if you have your values you would like to live by, then you can find this spot. And, you know, I was in, in car business, and I was very successful when I worked for Volkswagen Audi. But my values were not right in place. And when there came pressure on my value set, I started to move to another company. And uh, why did I go into ministry? Uh, that was an external call calling from God. So I can find my role in life. And I received an extra calling, what I think it was a calling. Basically, I only discovered it, it, that it was my calling after four or five years. When I uh, started to apply for the job, was more the initiative of my wife. She saw this advertisement. I finished my study geology. I, I had a lot of fun in my job. And she said, hey, Walter, you finished your study geology. You are in business. You know the downsides. You know the upside. Uh, why not help and serve business leaders? I said, I have a great job. Make a lot of money. Drive my range over. Have a nice home. Good income. Uh, and going then in ministry, I see all the people are poor and they are suffering and uh, I don't like it maybe so <laughs> much. And she said, but maybe it's a calling. I said, how can I know? Yeah, pray with it, with, with God. So I prayed for God about it, but I didn't receive an answer. Mm. And then I said to God, okay, I will apply for it. And if I become the preferred candidate, I will take the job with the price that, that it takes, uh, uh, less, uh, less salary and less income. So I wrote a letter. I became the preferred uh, candidate, and I became president, and I did it. Was that a calling? No, because I did not know. Uh, it was more or less an agreement with God. But after four or five years, you know, I'm entrepreneurial, and I've been there, seen it, done it, know everyone, and 
more or less looking for a new challenge. And in, at that point in, in my life, I received in one month four times the same dream, that I was working in my former company, being president, having a lot of fun, having the challenges of the business life, and I was longing for this life back. And uh, I talk, I was with my daughter in London, and we were on a, on a trip together, and uh, I told her about this four dreams. She said, Dad, probably God has a message for you. I said, you are so true. I prayed that night in my hotel room, and God was asking me, though what you do now, is that a calling? Or is it just something in between? You know, you were in business, you were successful, now you want to give some significance and purpose to your life, you did the ministry work, you've seen that, and now you go to the next step. I said, that's basically how I feel. But if I look at my history, then I think I made for what I do now. And you called me to be here. And when I accepted it as a calling, and I really received that as a calling now, I re the energy returned, the fun returned, the satisfaction returned, and I saw it really as something I should do and uh, I'm called to do. But I only discovered that backwardly and not uh, before. Uh, so if you talk uh, about a calling, I think every human has the as general callings, as I call it. We are called to serve and to help people. We are called to love people. We are uh, made to rule as a human race, uh, as human. We are the, the highest in, in the order of creation. So we, we have to set course. We have to take responsibility for our life. We have to take responsibility for, for nature. Uh, and in that taking responsibility, we don't do it from uh, bottom up, of bot uh, top down but we do it by serving others. Uh, uh, Jesus is talking about leadership. He said, don't be a leader like the rulers of this world. We want to be seen, we would like to be served by others, but serve the people. As And then he, he told this story at the, the final supper, and I think, as an example, he took away his clothes and he started to wash the feet of the disciples. Uh, and that story is in John, and the story about a serving uh, as a servant leader is in Luke, but it is the same occasion. And I think, yeah, we should behave in that way. So I, and I think that our general callings, everyone can do in every job at every point. I can love people when I'm a carpenter in a construction place and when I'm a leader. I can serve people when I'm this carpenter or I'm in school or a teacher. Uh, these are general callings, I call them. Sure, everyone is asking me about specific calling. What is the job I need to do? Now, that is what I already described, these four areas. Find them in your life, describe them, and you will find more or less the place where you can work and where you will flourish. Walter, uh, I would like to go to uh, last questions uh, for this episode. And uh, let's suppose that... Uh, you would have the opportunity only once in your life to go back in time and with your wisdom and experience now to give some advice uh, to yourself uh, at 20 years old. <laughs> What would you uh, say? <laughs> Do it exactly as I did. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, I never, I, I don't regret anything in my life. I mm -hmm. think everything was necessary to become the person I'm now. Mm. My failures, my wrongdoings, Uh, everything, uh, my ambition, uh, my failed ambition, uh, that I uh, run myself to the wall or drive myself to the wall, I needed it to become the person I am now. So I don't think you need to live life as it is, as it is presented to you, and learn from it. And I think it's necessary that you have sometimes pain, that sometimes you get ill, that sometimes a life is not going uh, as you wish, And you learn from it. You learn, you know, uh, I did not have so many sufferings. I had a very smooth life. So may maybe people listen with a lot of sufferings and, and then maybe I'm not a good person. But there are some persons who wrote down their sufferings and, and what they learned from it. And one is Paul, when he writes down in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he writes about, I was thrown for the lions, I was persecuted, people beat at me, uh, And I had a lot of suffering. And then he said, but I was not sure. I, I, I was desperate. I was crying to God. Uh, it hurts me. But what I also learned in that, that I now can have compassion with people who are in the same circumstances, that I can serve them better, 
who are in those circumstances. So he saw it as some kind of a formative process for him. Uh, sure, I think when you interview him in heaven, he said, do, do you think I want that? No, he doesn't <laughs> want it. <laughs> do you think uh, uh, he, it hurt him? He had pain. He cried about it. Sure, he had pain. He cried about it. But the challenge is, I think for life, whatever happens in your life, to, to give purpose to it. Not that it has a purpose in it or that it is brought to you by God or, or by evil because that's a question we most times cannot answer. Or, and when we answer it, there is easily to put a question mark behind, behind the answer. But who are you in the circumstances? That's the key question. Who are you and what did you learn and what did you do in those circumstances? I think that's also the, the, uh, the message of Viktor Frankl, uh, Frank, who was in the concentration camps and survived. And that he said, you have always the inner choice, the inner freedom to decide who you want to be within the circumstances. And I think that's the main question God asks us. Who were you when you saw someone poor? Who were you when you saw someone naked? Who were you when the migrants come into Europe and the foreigners come? Who were you when I was imprisoned? And who were you when you were successful and when had a lot of money? So the question, who you were, in those circumstances, is the main question. And I think those questions uh, are important. So it's not about, should I change my life? Should I have a better life? Should I shake other options? Life comes as it comes. It is not as makeable as we often think. But the question who we were in the different circumstances, in the different life phases, and that is important. Who were I when I was a father and a younger child, children? Was I a good father for those children? Was I a good husband for my wife? Was I a good boss for my staff and employees? Was I a good servant for my clients? That is more the question than that we change the circumstances or whatever. And sure, when you can improve the circumstances, you should do it. You are allowed to do it. God gave us talents. God gave us good uh, common sense. He gave us. He made us almost gods. So we can create, we can build in freedom, we can do whatever we like, etc. But do it within the values I give to you, and you will receive an abundant life. But he's not dictating everything, and we don't have to change life so much. But I can imagine when you had another life that you may have said, oh, this pain was so awful. Yeah, if I return back, I would try to avoid that. And that uh, I cannot say, because I think my life was a very beautiful life. I, as a young child, and you would write a book for yourself where you are the hero, uh, this could be my book. And sure, I made mistakes, sure, I hurt people, sure, I caused pain to people, I regret that, but it was not at the level that, uh, that I tried to avoid it the next time. I think it brought me and made me also who I am now. Thank you. Walter, thank you so much. We are really grateful that you uh, accepted the invitation to be here with us uh, today. And thank you so much for your wisdom, for your experience and for sharing uh, here at the Git Faith. We want to uh, be involved in a movement and to facilitate a movement for professionals, business people, entrepreneur managers that want to integrate their faith uh, with their uh, business, with their work. And uh, thank you so much for all your help and support, uh, for being an inspiration, for being a role model and for sharing with us. Thank you so much. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.